Just north of Padstow is Tintagel, which, along with St. Michael's Mount, constitute the two most dramatic sights along the path. If King Arthur did not sit with his knights at the round table here, he should have done. There could be no more romantic or impressive setting. The legend that this was King Arthur's seat seems to have been a Victorian invention. Although Roman pottery has been found here, excavations show that the castle was built at least four centuries after King Arthur's time. The castle was not originally built in two sections. Time and the sea's erosion did that, the bridge across the gap being widened at intervals. What is known for a fact about Tintagel is that it was once a monastery and later for a while a prison. Warwick the Kingmaker was held within its walls. The little white house with a beautiful view is Willow Park Coast Guard Station. It sits where once there was a Bronze Age promontory settlement. Flint weapons have been found that date back to the Stone Age. More recently, the area was known for its slate. Boys would be lowered over the cliffs on ropes to blast the slate free with dynamite. Willow Park guards the entrance to Boz Castle, a tiny port neatly folded into the hills. The outer jetty was hit by a mine in the last war and was rebuilt with granite by the National Trust in 1962. Boz Castle itself had one of the last staging inns in Britain. The railways didn't get here and horse-drawn coaches were used in the village up to the 1920s. In the opening of H.G. Wells's book, The Sleeper Awakes, the young artist, Mr. Isbister, walks from Boscastle to Pentagon Waterfall, where he encounters a melancholy insomniac about to commit suicide. He takes him back to Boscastle, where the man falls into a trance for 203 years. At the start of the Iron Coast is High Cliff, the highest part of the entire walk, but far from the most sheer. This was where Thomas Hardy met and courted his Emma. She was visiting her brother, a local curate, for whom Hardy was working as an architect. Together, Emma on horseback, they walked the coast from Boscastle to Bude excursions which he used in his book, A Pair of Blue Eyes. Cambeek is another of the promontories along the coast, 
and a place for appreciating the view in both directions, and the unusual folded rocks. At the beginning of time, most of Cornwall was covered in forest, and every now and then, the roots of primeval trees are exposed along the coast at exceptionally low tides or after a storm. There was once an act of parliament to develop Crackington Haven, to build a harbour, bring in the railway and create a new town to be called Victoria. Not surprisingly, it came to naught. Crackington Haven remains undeveloped. The area around Bude is where the Cornish Royalists won a stunning victory against superior forces in the Civil War and began a drive up the centre of Cornwall and Devon to join up with other Royalists at Devizes. Near Lower Sharpnose Point in the last century, the eccentric parson poet, Robert Hawker, built himself a shack of driftwood dragged up from the rocks below. In it, he wrote The Quest of the Sangral. The beautiful cliffs of Devon around Heartland Point at their best in the evening sunlight, look straight out to sea and the tiny island of Lundy, a few miles offshore. A long time ago, a local MP won a valuable contract to ship convicts overseas. He saved himself time and money by taking them only as far as Lundy, but successfully pleaded that Lundy was out of the country. This area is the Westward Ho created by Charles Kingsley, whose father was the rector of Clavelli at the beginning of the 19th century. The valley itself is well camouflaged by trees and hills and has been described as a village like a waterfall. Charles Dickens and Wilkie Collins came here on their travels around Britain and wrote about it in A Message from the Sea. And in a field here, the man who wrote Tarka the Otter, Henry Williamson, lived in a homemade hut with photographs of the First World War on the walls. <laughs> 